Yes, hello, folks. Welcome to the weekly Manchester United pod. I'm your host, as always, Phil Brown, joined with my regular co host, the excellent James Rhodes. It's been two weeks since we last recorded. Um, we, of course, recorded shortly after the Liverpool game where there was a massive emotional high. We were quickly brought back down to earth at the weekend. Every time United win a game like they won against Liverpool, we asked the same question how they turned the corner and we get the same answer. They repeatedly let you down. <laughs> What I don't understand, James, is okay, Phil. But how is it that you're that bad? That performance was a disgrace. They, yeah. yeah. I'll get to go ahead, we'll go cover, ahead. obviously this will cover Ten Hall, we'll cover the Jason Wilcox news, of course, which is breaking as we recording and the Barada stuff and maybe Don Ashworth. But um you know, I get take some flack on social media at the weekend because people misunderstood what I was saying. I'm not saying Ten Hag is into them. I'm not saying don't sack him. What I'm asking you to do is to make sure that when you sack him, you know exactly why he failed so that you can correct this going forward. Because in the past, United have reacted to results, sacked the manager to get better results without asking why can we not win these games? Why are we stuck in this consistent cycle? I don't think they wanted to ask that question because the answer involved, first of all, them asking the question, you're a part of the problem. You, you need to change the way this football club is run for this to change. Any of us will do that. But what we saw at the weekend was indefensible. Yeah, it was. And 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 we talked about it last time because we said it before, funnily enough, I think Brentford F, uh, before an international break in that late win against Brentford. We talked about how we had that win and then an international break and we came back and it was the same usual crap. And it's kind of crazy because I think that that Brentford game, I think that Brentford game was worse than the 4-0 loss in many ways uh, Mm -hmm. at the beginning. When you talk about the performance, it easily could have been seven. I mean, it was one of those games that they could have just kept scoring goals if they could find the net at all. Um, It was probably, I think, the second worst performance I've seen this season. <clears throat> behind the loss to Bournemouth 4-0, I believe it was at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, this was up there. Uh, I would say that one was worse because it was at home. This was up there. It was awful. Uh, they had absolutely no idea what to do. The, I, I have no idea. I, I can't say I'd, there was a single player that I would claim had a good performance in that game. Not a single one. There was some okay last yeah, yeah, yeah. ending. Yeah, Onana. Yeah, good point. Yes. Mm-hmm. At which, how many years is the goalkeeper going to be our best player at United? Mm-hmm. How frustrating is that? On, I would say Onana is probably our most consistent player this season now in the league. And that's incredibly frustrating that our goalkeeper continues to be the most important player. Um, I don't even know what to say. I mean, the, the exact same problems that showed up before showed up again. And Brentford play in a very direct very physical style of of football that is unfortunately probably the worst aspect of of this Ten Hag team in defending is defending against straight route one physical play that just cuts right through you. Um, They pretty much let us have the ball in many instances and then would drop off and we had no real threat in uh, breaking them down. And then they would just go fast right through our team so many instances, three passes from the goalkeeper, and they're in on net. It's it's almost unbelievable that that happens, but it just kind of shows that you know the emotional high of a Liverpool game that almost played into our hands a bit by being basketball back and forth the way that we like it. It's just that it's a one-off, and unfortunately, it's the good games that are a one-off, not the bad games at this point. Yeah, and that's just where we I are. Know. Ten Hag's always one to feed away from having his, you know, legitimacy questions. Yeah. And that's not a good position for him to be in no. because um, you just can't survive being that fragile. These are the types of things that have to die with this season. These types of yeah. performances, these types of, you know, here, here, here's the thing, James. I was looking back through some of my old notes. And I remember uh, looking at a game where you never played against Leicester. Um I think it was shortly after they lost to Liverpool and City 5 at 2 0. And Brendan Rodgers was remarking about how easy it was to pass through United's midfield. And I was looking at 
notes with uh, you know uh, saying things like emphasizing things like the, you, attacking. You know, is you can attack individually and hope for a bit of individual magic, but you can't defend. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. they've been doing this forever. And this uh -huh. is what I can understand is that. When I look at Ten Hag last season, he clearly knows how to set a football team up. But for some reason, what's happening right now is unbelievable. Mm. I mean, I'm not a big lover of using stats to make an argument. I mean, the menu is not the dinner that they help you, but they're not, you know, they don't they, they can be manipulated. The shot stats conceded are are are, are, are horrendous. And it's just yeah. basically all averages. If you're conceding that many shots in a game against professional footballs, you're going to concede goals. But also, another ugly aspect showed up at the weekend that has been missing for a while, but continues to rear its head. You need to play that game for 107 minutes and don't concede. The minute they score, they concede. I know. And I'm going, how is it that this continuously happens? And I'm looking at that goal. The ball gets knocked over the top. wan is ball-watching. And he plays everyone on side. The same thing happened at Newcastle away. Where if you have him mentally engaged in a one-on-one -on -one thing, but once that is not the case, he's a tendency to mentally drift. And of course yeah. he plays Brantford on side. I mean, it would have been dead egg robbery had you never know, won the game. But you're looking at these consistent things showing up and going, you know, this is really, really poor. I mean, this is... Yeah. The, for the United players, how timid they are out of possession, how slow they are in possession, and you're not going to break a professional football team down by a little pass here, a little pass here. Just watch how many times they got the ball, moved it to the left and moved it to the right from a standing position with no intensity, no speed. Even when they when Bradford would concede from a set piece or an attack, how slow they were bringing the ball. I mean, how many times did Anana almost get booked for time wasting in a game they had to run? Yeah, it's it's hard to understand that. It's hard to understand why, you know, they uh, why it changes so much, um, you know, and 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 why some of these basics just can't get in in terms of the the way that they play. You'd think that there would be a lot more intensity across the board, but it's lacking everywhere. I mean, it is I, it is lacking in every single position. And it's, you know, the thing that is really confusing to me, it's like you said, um, about being so easy to pass through. When I look at last season, there was two things that I thought were successful, and I thought we overperformed a little bit anyway, but there was two things that were probably successful. Uh, and it, it really lines up with the quote you just said, is that individually you can, you can get some magic to attack and score goals, but defensively it's as a unit. Uh, last season, during the very good run, Obviously, on the goal scoring front, Marcus Rashford went on a pretty like uh, something he's not duplicating this year, and you probably wouldn't expect him to duplicate because I think it was the best goal scoring form in all of Europe for about a three month period, and that was a huge part of the goals that United were scoring more than anything else. That was a big part of it. But defensively, they were very compact, very compact, very mm -hmm. solid, very well yeah, set up defensively. In the, in the yep. league. Yeah, and and you look at it and, and say. Why is it so much worse? Mm -hmm. You know, when Casemiro comes on, they look worse most of the time this season. But it's also the setup. You know, when I watch it, it's I feel I'm very uh, concerned. You know, Copy My has been getting a lot of um, is going is getting a lot of uh, uh, obviously deserved praise and hype and all of that. I really worry about him in that midfield and what's going to happen to him when you watch how he played and had to play against, against Brentford. It was impossible. It is an impossible job for him to do uh, to play in that midfield. I, I have no idea how you could ask any player to do that, especially one who you're trying to properly develop and mold into, you know, a, a, a certain type of player and develop what he's doing. It is an impossibility. And, and the task is, I don't know. I, I really worry about that aspect of it um, from that standpoint. And I don't know what the answer is, but to me, the, the, the really obvious thing that I just cannot understand and what really concerns me that I, that I tweeted out during the game as well, I posted late in the game, is it seems like that Scott McTominay goal is practically plan A at this point. That late run, late game goal from Scott McTominay is practically plan A. And it throws so much out of whack. He's been so good at that, 
but he has zero effect on the rest of the game behind the goal, the final third. He has no effect on it. He really doesn't. And it, and it, and it, it's just the nature of, you know, his strengths as a player. I'm not even blaming him. He's done really well what he's been asked to do. Um, so it's really hard. I don't want to sit there and, and talk about any individual from from the team or through Ten Hag and say they're that one person is to blame because they win as a team and they lose as a team at this point. And I think you, it, there's just something fundamentally wrong with with all of it that's just not working. And um, and it and it doesn't look like it's going to be solved. You know, if it's not solved well, now, this it's April first. They're not making changes. This isn't going to be resolved in the next ten games. I mean. If I, I'm, I'm with the farm ten hog, and I understand he's in a bit of a difficult position because if one of the things that I credited him with last season was his direct honesty in yeah. interviews. Now he's never been one to get over carried away with wins, and he's not someone that gets overly negative with defeats. And um, I look at him and I thought last season I really appreciated how direct he was. Uh, and he can be that way when he wants. He was like that with Jaden Sancho. But when you're prevaricating over performances and saying things that defy what your eyes just saw, you know, that we mm -hmm. played well or this or that, there has to be a way of saying it as you see it with a, you know, and I understand he doesn't want to lay into some of his players. I get that. But that's unacceptable. I mean, United fans go down to London, you know, East, the, the, the night before Easter Sunday. It's... You know, they're not getting out of that game. Bear in mind, it went on for, you know, an hour and 10 minutes. You know, so about after, but almost 11 before they get out of that ground. At night, no train home. And they put that performance in. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, the, look at, I, I was watching it the weekend. I was, this one of the things that was infuriating me was the type of genetic world possession. How mm. easy they were to pass through. But, I think that what you're seeing is partly a lack of intensity from those players because just assuming this is the case, I don't think they believe they're set up correctly. I yeah. think in their mind they're going, I'm not going to chase this 50-50 ball because there's someone five feet away that's going to pick up. And once players lose belief that what you're, they can accomplish what you're asking them to do, yeah. this is what you see. You don't get 95%, you get 50%. Right. Yeah. And this yeah. is this is a turn out has to fix this problem. I don't care how practical he has to be, but he cannot continue to do this and expect to keep his job at the end of the season. Yeah, well, I would agree with you because I think this is where people get mistaken on this idea of losing the dressing room and things like that. Um, because I don't believe that happens in the manner that people say it does uh at all. Um, I don't think that any player steps on and wants to lose a game. I don't think that any manager coaches a game and wants to lose a game. I don't think that anybody at that level of uh, – except maybe some of them who are betting on the games, but uh, it's a different story. <laughs> uh, but I don't think any of the other ones actually intend to do that. But it is correct. I mean, look, anything that you do in life, if you're unsure about what you're doing, you're going to be bad at it, and it can appear to be lack of effort, uh, lack of focus, all of that. The more certainty that you have in anything, the more you can direct 100%, you know, towards doing it and, uh, and and do it as fully and as much as possible. And I see it. There was a lot of instances in that game where players like Garnacho had started some sort of press that wasn't followed up with maybe in the way he was expecting mm -hmm. and turns around and goes, what's going on? And it's like from the midfield or from a fullback or from – and it was happening all over the pitch. The players are totally – not on the same page. And so it leads to timidness. Like, well, should I, shouldn't I, do I back off? You know, and then you'll see Bruno go tearing into a press, but it's not followed up with by the next midfielder or by the fullback. Or by the, and it just becomes a, a mess. And, and I think that is the biggest issue, as you say, is that, you know, they step out there and when they know what they're doing, you can see it and it works. It, it's obvious to me that that is the case too, the, the complete lack of confidence in, in how they're being set up working because it hasn't been working. And when you set up and you go for it and then a team just pings the ball right through you, you start to go, 
wait a second, something's wrong here. And naturally, you're going to try to also then start adjusting individually on your own to try to solve that problem, which can create more problems for somebody else because now the team's out of cohesion, even if the setup was wrong. Yeah. It, it's really a, a poor chain of events. And, and there's obviously a lot of smart people who've analyzed how it's going and why and all that. And I'm, I don't think I have the, you know, the brain for that type of thing, but um, it's not working. That much is clear. Well, you know, look, here's the thing. If you look at 10 Hogs lineups most weeks this season, typically they've included in the team two to three players that he actually sent. So I'm not saying mm -hmm. that he doesn't have mitigation. I accept that. But just because he didn't send players doesn't mean he doesn't want players or he doesn't Correct. rate them or he doesn't think they're good yeah. enough to, because, you know, how different would United look at the weekend if they had all their players back? <coughs> we'll have yeah. Shaw and Martinez in central defense. I'm trying to think, you know, where anyone Maybe Casemiro, but I'm not sure if he would even start at this point. Or, you know, so we're, so this is pretty much, give or take, United's you know, best team. Right? Yeah, with the, yeah. With, with a couple of key players. We, you know, obviously Martinez is big. He didn't look much fit at the weekend. You're looking at that going, I think in your second season, you know, you should, we, we have a right to expect better. Look, I know that you needed a mess internally, but Ten Hag took the job knowing you needed didn't have a football structure mm -hmm. behind him. He knows what a football structure looks like. There's one at Bayern, there's one at Ajax. He knows what one looks like. And yes, you needed have been in constant limbo with the football club, you know, trying to be sold, running on fumes, no proper preparation and signings and all that. Um, and he did, I have to say, I think he overachieved in his first season. Yeah. Um, I think that... Um, for Ten Hag, you know, I, I, I want him to work. I do. I want every native manager to work. And if I felt that all United's problems would leave with him, I'd want him gone today. But I want this decision made by football people that can yep. look at this and say, look, this is why this guy failed. Okay, mm -hmm. not the result. Because failure is not an event, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And to understand it, you have to understand where you went wrong in the process. Correct. Right. Collective failure, not an individual failure. And this is the problem with United yeah. in the past. We've always seen as an individual failure, not collective. So it's never resulted in structural change. Finally, now you have people inside the football club that are demanding the highest standards who will support managers with the you know with amazing resources and give you a functional football club. And now we can make a decision and say we know why we failed, let's fix that. I'm not yeah. saying so. This is the argument I was trying to make on social media. I'm not saying keep ten hog, I'm saying. It's really, really important that it, to understand the solution, you understand the problem. This is why this happened, right? And I'm sure 60 to 70 percent of the answers to those questions don't even involve Ten Hag. But that doesn't mean that he keeps his job. I mean, at any other top football club, he wouldn't have. And so the yep. fact that he's being protected a bit by the chaos behind the scenes, and once that chaos gets removed, in many ways, it removes. His excuses for failure. Yeah. And um, as we've said before, United have had two really successful managers in a 146 year history. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to get the right guy. And this is hard. Most managers, you know, most clubs get it wrong. Um, but this is this next decision has to be a proper evaluation process um, that understands the problem. Agreed. And, you know, uh... A couple times now, and uh, you know, Ineos do these little videos once in a while, and I do mean Ineos, like they do these little videos once in a while, mm -hmm. where they talk about kind of the latest across the whole brand, right, and everything that's involved in it. And they put another one out again, I think, at the end of last week, and they have little interviews with Sir Jim, and they were doing this one from Old Trafford, like the sort of the stage was set on it, and they talked to him again, and I think it's the third time that he said um, that he needs patience that the fans need some patience now because it's two to three years before you're going to expect to see uh, results, he says. But I want to see the trajectory going the right mm -hmm. direction. And the thing that I think, you know, people will look at it and say, well, if we just sold these two players, we're solved, we're fixing it. And it's a joke. It's a joke. I think, unfortunately, people have convinced themselves too many times, all of us have, because you know we always want to be optimistic and think we're almost there, that the club is almost there, that it's, yeah. it's just these few problems would solve it. It's not. People yeah. need to grasp that this is a bad football club. 
Okay, like it's a harsh sort of things to say, but this is a bad football club. And I mean, as a whole, it's been. <clears throat> and it needs to, and resolving it is not fast. And it's not about results. You know, you can get second in the Premier League, like we had under Jose and like we had under Ollie, and be mm -hmm. miles away from being a good team. You can be miles away because you can luck results in the short term. You always can. But um, it is a process that results in results. And when the process is working correctly, the results will waver and they'll waver, but they'll continue on an upward trajectory. That is the point of it. A regular, steady, linear upward trajectory that isn't about, you know, peaks and valleys, but the kind of the middle ground of where it's going to be. And that has been lacking at, at United. It's been flat forever. And it's been based on these luck based good year, bad year, good year, bad year, you know, which is just simply the basis of, of not knowing, you know, what the, the right process is and not having one. So sometimes you luck into some good players. Sometimes you luck into some good coaching. Sometimes you luck into some, a good group that kind of works together. And sometimes you don't. Um, and so it's up and down and, there and back. And, and so, yeah, I mean that I completely a hundred percent agree with that. I have my own opinions, you know, on 10 hog on the process on all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, like I've said, I, I back whatever they're going to end up doing. Even if I think today that there's basically zero chance in my mind that 10 hog is the right guy. If they were to say, you know what, we're going to continue with him. I'm, I'm back in it a hundred percent fully because it mean I know it will be made based on the process, you know, on doing the right things and on the right decision moving forward. Um, yeah, you have to evaluate his entire work. Like Martin Edwards yeah. said that if Ferguson didn't lose it far as well as true and I don't know, he still wouldn't have sacked him because they could see all the other work that was going on. Yeah. You know, you so you have to look beyond the result. You know, the results are obviously the old, most important thing, but you don't sack out a guy because of a bad result. You sack them for bad yes. work that resulted yeah. in that this, that, that happening. Mm -hmm. You never haven't had people internally capable of evaluating good from bad work. But he, here's the thing, James. One of the things that Solskjaer was saying in that interview with Gary Neville is the target every year was top four. Yeah. And when your target every year is top four, there's a couple of things happening there. One, the message you're sending to your players is it's okay to lose. You know, it's not terminal to our season if you lose 10 games, seven games, whatever, right? Yeah. If you're trying to win the league, losing a game is a crisis. You're trying to finish mm -hmm. top four, it's not. So inevitably, when you have top four as your target, one or two years you're going to overperform, one or two years you're going to underperform. So you know where they finished third, second, anywhere from third, second to fifth, sixth. When they underperform, they're finishing just outside the top four. When they overperform, they're finishing just above the top four. And you get this variance because occasionally they, they you know, some of that depends on the decline of other teams, of course. But yeah. you know, when you're part of the top four, this is what you should be expecting every year. Yeah. Is that you're gonna pretty much be within a spot or two of that of your target, which they yeah. usually are. When you're finishing top four, you know, Arsenal go out last January and get what they got, Trossard and who who he also did this Jorginho, right? Um, United got vague horse and Sabitza. United yep. don't make you know make any of their loan deals permanent for obvious reasons. This is a football club that hasn't been trying to compete with Man City and Liverpool and the top teams at the top because it's not been their goal, right? Now yep. that being said, right, I, I, you that thankfully is going to change, and um, yep. I don't you know it, it, I think that we have to realize that like everything inside that football club. You and I expect trophies, but the Glazers just they, just they just wanted to qualify for financial revenue streams. That was it, yeah. and and um, inevitably they came sh came up short. But um, what I see from United and I is, I mean, it's infuriating to watch that that Brantford game at the weekend. Just there was a point during the Liverpool game, second half, when I was angry because Liverpool were completely dominating the game. I don't think mm -hmm. they'll make a mistake next weekend. That if they dominate the game, they won't kill it. That captured in the game, got them a minute, a last minute equalizer or 87 minute equalizer. Um, if they get big word against Liverpool next week and, and, and it's bad, I think Ten Hag would find himself in a very difficult position. Yeah. And honestly, I wouldn't look past Chelsea away. 
or you know it's a difficult oh, yeah, place to play at yeah. the bridge this week i mean it's yeah, a difficult and that's what three games and three days in between those yeah. two games it's a difficult place to play i understand chelsea aren't very good they've also held city to a draw twice this year yeah, and, and they, have, that, and they yeah they come up in some big games they have a lot of talent it's just a mass of a club at the moment kind of like us in many respects um i say a lot mm -hmm. of there's a lot of similarities between chelsea and united and so writing them off when they could just pop up in a big game and win it against you, especially a way where United haven't won, I think, since 2019 or 20 or something like that. It's a tough one. Um, and then Liverpool at the weekend. So, yeah, I think this is – it's unfortunate because the Brentford game was probably the one you really, really couldn't lose of these three, and you couldn't drop points in of these three. Um, these are going to be tough, and I think they are defining. And it's and it's not so much about you know the point being uh, that – results are everything because they're not there's a lot of evaluations that'll go into ten hog into the manager and all of that but um bad results don't help you you know what i mean like good results can help you a little bit but on the overall argument but bad results really don't and if they start to knock you out of the champions league spots which i think one more loss it's finished frankly i mean it's 11 points off aston villa I don't, yeah, points off it's, it's, it's over more, right we, we could more, probably yeah. say it's over at this point yeah. but they're the further it falls team. yeah and and the further it falls the more they're gonna have to if they're deciding to make that change they're gonna have to be looking at other managers talking to them and and, and really getting active on it and that's the type of thing that won't be kept private which means mm -hmm. i think you, you start to see some some stuff actually come out i was expected once the kind of champions league thing is settled a little bit then either way they'll start to, to move forward and when you look at it uh which we'll get to today obviously they're they're doing the same on the other fronts and so the managers essentially what's going to come under scrutiny next for the for the coming plans yeah, and you know, the, I think there's some other interest in Nardis over the next two months. Marcus Rashford has two months to see if his Euros career, yeah, yeah, if he's going yeah. to get picked. If he doesn't find consistency in the next two months, he doesn't go to the Euros. I want to see what response that brings out in him. I want to see what response it brings out in other players um, who are yeah. in similar situations. You know, how badly do you want to go to the Euros this summer? How badly do you want to make sure you're still here? next summer yeah because as much as ten hog look here's the thing is if you want to play instead you have to get players capable of playing that way you know ralph ronnie yeah. talked yeah. about this you know you have you you build the squad year after year after you're yeah. built on players that can actually play that way if, if, if pep guardiola takes over for sheffield united he's not playing tiki taka for obvious reasons so it's mm -hmm. good, right Ten Hag clearly doesn't have the players to play the way he wants to play but a top coach has to adjust his tactics when he said united wouldn't play like ajax this is because he didn't have the same players. Different league, different pace, different everything. Diff you know, you get punished for your mistakes in the Premier League. And, you know, Brantford had a far better striker on the field than what United did. You know, you, you, you have to have really, really good players playing a cohesive system that gives you a chance to win. And the first thing you do is by nullify a threat, which, you know, United always keep a team in the game, you know, mm -hmm. because they're so wide open. Um uh, you and I, I accept Ten Hag has some major, major mitigating. You know, the fact he hasn't had a left back all season is an absolute disgrace to any professional football team. The fact he hasn't had a striker for the most of the previous season is unacceptable. Um, but at the same time, you have to have a bit of a. What, what, one of the things that concerned me about the weekend was the fact that it was pretty obvious after about 25 minutes how United were getting broken down and attacked. And they were not capable of making an adjustment to nullify that threat. Brantford made an adjustment after 10 minutes when United started well, changed the game completely. Ten Hag was unable to make any adjustments in that game um, to nullify a pretty basic threat. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It, it was, it's very, you know, it, that's happened a few times where the other team, you know, you have a good kind of opening 10, 12 minutes, and then the other team makes one adjustment, and United are incapable of adjusting back. James, I'll be honest. Ten Hag's up against Thomas Frank three times, and Thomas Frank is outclassed up. every time. I know. I mean, United put up a miracle winning at home; they didn't deserve it. Um, you know, Ten like I said, I thought this was worse than the 4-0 in, in Ten Hag's second game, and, the, and this was less forgivable. You know, you could understand yeah. the first one because it didn't happen, yeah. but this is by this stage. You know, yes, certain players. Are, it's fine if you can implement the playing style that can win you the league. 
but you should be able to implement the playing style they can win at Brantford with the team and players. Fulham and, team. and yeah. yeah, I mean, what if you go manage an international team? You can't send all the players that you want. You have to be able to yeah, you get what you get. <laughs> play with the players that you have, yeah. and yeah. and you know, top managers can do that. And I think the Ten Hag, you have to look at players and say, okay, this is how we get this team to win. And right now, Eric. Yeah. Your most important responsibility is to get wins, not to have yep. beautiful football. It's just get wins. And yep. to me, the Brantford Fulhams, as I said, after the Liverpool game, you know, if you had to lose Liverpool and City, I get it, you know, but far more to define and to me is the Brantford, the Fulhams, those yep. kind of defeats, the Bournemouth, exactly. because those, those are not forgivable. And those yep. are the things that to me, you know, Ten Hag, doesn't have a legitimate um out you know the, the copenhagen the galatasaray stuff because so much of it just looks to me like idiocy yeah agreed absolutely um, agreed. Okay, mate, we only have been over 15 minutes or so left here let's have a conversation on um any of us as expected moving quite quickly uh they looks like they've agreed a deal for jason wilcox who's going to come in to be part of the recruitment team what's your understanding there yeah, uh, I got a little heads up on this that I wasn't really sure what to make of last night. And um, I just was like, I guess we'll see what happens on it. But a couple of things have happened. They've been in touch for, for quite a while. Uh, from what it looks like, they made an approach and made an offer today in order to um, <clears throat> to buy him out of his contract um, in what they felt was like the terms of his deal. Uh, <coughs> and then it seems that Southampton were kind of holding on for a little bit more Fabrizio Romano has said that he resigned, he, he's resigning essentially today. And um, what that will do, it doesn't change the, the need for a notice period. Uh, it simply puts a little bit more pressure on Southampton to accept the money because they don't have somebody. There's no point in him, you know, otherwise he, he's not working for them anymore. Um, and likely they won't accept the money. And what's been going on here is, is I think, I, I don't remember how much he spoke about it in the last, podcast but obviously it's been taking a while on this Ashworth thing Newcastle have been extremely um uh you know uh, stubborn on, on you know on on allowing this on any sort of change in terms of the start date for Dan Ashworth he will join United it's like a foregone conclusion that that is happening he's you know all the things that have occurred um the question has always been now in the last little while is when and they've been very stubborn there. And so the problem you have is that you kind of want to get somebody who's, you know, Omar Barada is good, is very experienced. He can work on deals. He's done a lot of that, but you don't necessarily want him doing entirely focused on recruitment this summer. Um, you do want some people coming in. And so, you know, they were looking at kind of alternative plans because initially the goal was get Ashworth in first, then the rest, you know, and, and move it down the dominoes like that. Um, but with that taking a while, you know, they, they were looking at kind of some alternative plans and it looks like the idea is essentially press ahead with Jason Wilcox, have him oversee recruitment for this summer and get directly involved right away um, in, in helping to make these things happen, you know, with the connections that he has, the experience that he has. And uh, I think this definitely speaks to, you know, one that they, they, they're ready. Like we talked about, they, they're going to, you know, summer starts now. That's what we've been saying. Mm -hmm. you, know, you reach end of March, this international break that just occurred. That's when you really get going. That is 100% when recruitment really gets going. They've made a lot of basic contacts, but now they're going to want to be pressing ahead on those deals and starting to really line things up and and really form what they're doing for next season. And so uh, I think time is of the essence now. Um, as far as I've heard, I expect that they'll probably still get this done, even though there's a little bit of conflict here, given that he's resigned Southampton. Well, maybe there are players already planned for next season since they probably conspired at the England camp where Gareth yeah, right. was actually picking at the players to <laughs> get Eric Ten Hag sacked so that he could be their new manager. No, you don't think that's a plausible theory, no? Oh, yeah, very plausible, yeah. yeah. That was the other thing. Let's sit down with Marcus and, Mar and, and the boys who don't actually be picked by Gareth. Hey, let's get uh, Eric sacked so I can be on the bench. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Rashford is somebody who I think <laughs> has been very underplayed for England. Even when he was in his best run of form, the amount of time he played at like the World Cup and stuff, even scored a couple of goals and still didn't get on the pitch. So who knows? I can't really see that um, <laughs> being anyway. the case, considering the giant contingent, you know, of, of we only have like three English players left anyway at United at this point in time. But, uh, but yeah, I think Wilcox, his remit, obviously, you know, when you look at where he's coming from, um, 
Omar Barada, City, the multi-club model. Jason Wilcox, uh, Academy Director at Manchester City. Uh, Dan Ashworth, highly responsible for a big part of the, the young, in, the youth English setup, which is resulting in some of the best, you know, English setup that has been for a long, long time. So when you kind of look at the focus here, there's an interesting kind of three things that, that Ineos are trying to do that I think are worth mentioning is one, the multi-club model. Um, getting that is the way of the future it is necessary yeah. um you know how you have a player like a, a fundi this young italian player who's joined la swan on uh, la swan on, on loan has a 15 million buyout that would be a by far and away a record transfer for them but if they buy him and united can buy him and even loan him back for a year to continue his development there they can turn a profit in there and and this is sort of the use of of this kind of model they're looking a big thing they're looking at that I do want to stress in this in this podcast now is the South American market. A huge, yeah, we'll huge thing they want to. Yeah, yeah, they really, really want to go ahead. And I did get some new, like just more encouragement on that front that it is absolutely they're having regular discussions, talks, scouting, looking at players there. Um, yeah. There's young Brazilian players like uh, there's one named Thales, Thales. Um, but you know, joining somewhere like United straight away is probably really difficult for a lot of these players. Um, sometimes from an age perspective because of Brexit, and sometimes just from a readiness where you want them to go somewhere else. But looking at those players and saying, could they go to Nice next season? Uh, absolutely becomes viable. And so Omar Barad, a big part of that. Um, you know, but then as well, recruiting young and buying players young oh. to really build this team out is something where Wilcox, Ashworth have a yeah, lot of experience with. Because obviously yeah. Brayton targeted that market quite a bit. Yes. And, and Anselm, you know, is someone that Brayton looked at for quite a long time. So I imagine yes. that part of Ashworth's list. And obviously that is a type of signing that are looking to make and use yep. the multi-club model. I, I got really good information on this. I mean, yeah. You start talking about this five six months ago at least, yes. where yes. you know United were heavily targeting the young South American market. Um, I know they're looking at a few kids in uh, Croatia, so it, it yes. is uh, in that league too, uh, Croatia, yep. Serbia, yep. Um, in the Eastern European League. So um, I think you'll see a lot more of this type of signing, um, yep. and uh, you know it's really important that United are able to use that. That you're saying in Savio this summer is exceptional. Player yeah. Here. yeah. Done really, really well, Girona. Um, and uh, you know, these are the things that uh, United have, should have been able to use for quite a while. Let me ask you about um, Anselmino and some of the other things. What uh, What are you hearing on it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that would be this is the young Argentinian, right? Yeah, it's uh, not the back of Boca Juniors. The, you yeah, know, he would be on loan. Yeah. He would go on loan for sure to Nice. I think I you want to send him to What's that? I think they wanted to bring him over to Lausanne first, then to yeah, it could, Nice. Yeah, that, um, that could be the case. But he'll definitely go on loan if they sign him. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he's a talented young kid, but you know, they'd obviously want to get these players um, quite early. Uh, I know that they wanted um, young Argentinian kid that City signed after the. Uh, Yes. 2017, I forget his name. You know, we're looking at him quite heavily too, but they lack the context to get these deals done before other clubs. So, you know, it's something that um, we'll see a lot more of. I know they liked uh, William Esteval kid. I uh, know they've watched him a lot. Um, so uh, I think um, you're quite right. It's difficult with Brexit, but there's ways around this. Um, Go ahead with Ashworth. So you were saying that um, you feel that uh, he, um, you've got a couple minutes left on that to go. Yeah. You got, yeah. Uh, what do um, you think he'll get done by the summer? No, I don't. I don't think he'll join by the summer. I think that's sort of where it's heading at the moment is that it's, there's no, I guess, like as of today, there's no, there's nothing to say he's going to start before summer. And it's been really difficult to, to, that's what they've been pushing for. But, they've continued to run in kind of a brick wall of it, 20 million, you know, to, to start before summer, which is an insane amount considering the PSR problems, things like that. You don't amortize that when you're paying for a director, it's just 20 million in, in a straight loss. And they need this season to have positive financial results to enable them to spend an enormous amount. I mean, over the next few years to do what they need to do. So no, I, I think that, that, that as I was gathering, they were working on it, but starting to look at some kind of like alternative plans for this year to, to try to sort this summer out and get things moving still without it being totally held up. 
I strongly suspect they'll end up getting a deal sometime before midsummer for him to join in September or October in the end. And that's what will happen. Um, on the 20 million thing with Ashworth, then yes, in, in terms of precedent, the 20 million is absorbent. I think yeah. this is going to be normal because as we get into PSR, that becomes absolutely vital. The football clubs are running, financial doping gets harder. There's a real dearth of people yeah. with quality and experience that are capable of running a football club like that. So that one, you can get the advantages from being run economically and 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 you know and being run in, in an efficient way. And I think that they're going to become so much more valuable and important to successfully run football clubs. Uh, I mean. You think about you know paid minery a little more than that in commission for Pogba, um, yeah. and I just feel that you know this this is going to become normal. I think that you're going to see high end executives constantly getting poached because they're so vital. Now I'm making sure that your football club is run accordingly. So um, I don't know if you know will pay the twenty million, but I have to be honest. I'm one of the ones that would think that. I would pay it. I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, United have been running their ground by really, really poor executives. No one's more responsible for United's demise in their current situation than the really bad management. Yeah, I know. And it, it's a little bit of a tricky thing because it's like you buy a player for 20 million, they're going to be on the pitch. You buy a director for 20 million. Technically, they don't do anything, you know, by, by nature of buying them, like just automatically in one very direct way of looking at it, but in a lot of ways that 20 million is a better investment than yeah. any other investment you could make. And so well, I'm not, I'm not in disagreement. I, I guess the question would be, you know, how much uh, weighing up, how much you could affect in a very short amount of time. Think about this. He was one yeah. of the main reasons why Brighton saying Caicedo. And yeah. then he's gone for what, a hundred million. Yeah, compare himself. I, I, mean, that. I mean, if he, he just one deal like that, you know, justifies it instead of walking in and paying 80 million, 95 million for Anthony, you have a proper guy that plans it out properly, you get him for half a price. I, I, I it's it, the way you scale their contributions, obviously, different from an on the field sporting contribution. But, um, one of the things that makes City so successful is they have highly competent people yeah. in those positions, yeah. know what they're doing. Yeah. And all it takes is one idiot in the chain for everything. Um, you know, any of us know what they're doing, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, obviously you, you, you have sticker shock immediately, but when you seriously think about it. I would hope they resolve it. You know, I still hope that they will resolve it and get it done, you know, in time. It's just, yeah. It's well, just how important is that to the Ten Hog decision? I don't think as much as it might be made out. Uh, I don't think they have to wait for, for Dan Ashworth to get in to be deciding on a lot of things like that. Um, no, but if you're the new manager, you'd want to know who you're working for, right? Oh, for sure. And that's why I think that they the, either way they have to resolve it so that you know when he's coming in uh, within the next few months. One way or another, that like it has to be settled that he's joining, you know, and, and a date. You know, that has to be settled for sure because you need to understand what the – what the remit is, you know, at the same time, you know, obviously I think that's a big part of why you'd want to get in someone like Jason Wilcox. Wilcox got who's that a, what's that? Rudy Wilcox got an answer to that question. Who am I working for? Yeah. Well, one thing obviously that helps is that he's experienced working in, in the past under Omar Barada in some capacity. Right. So he's, he's familiar with him um, from, from being at city beforehand. And, and that'll help. I mean, when you look at it in one way, you know, Wilcox is a director of football right now. I think that's why he's a priority because even if Dan Ashworth doesn't come in between Barada and Wilcox, you have a normal team's amount of football expertise, maybe a little bit better than that, given the nature of their histories um, in there. So it would help. Uh, you know, I think when you throw Dan Ashworth into the mix, you make maybe one of the better sporting structures in, in Europe by putting it all together. So I, I think that, you know, at the same time, there's, with this whole gardening leaf thing, there's a degree of, you know, how much conversation occurs anyway, that obviously has been going on with Omar Barada mm -hmm. regardless. Um, and you have to imagine how much with, with Dan Ashworth, regardless, you know, at least in terms of coordinating things properly. Um, I still think overall one would look at it and say, 
have Barada. Ashworth will come at some point when Wilcox looks like that's moving ahead now, and they'll probably make another hire after that too. And I think that anybody who's smart would look at this job if they were to hire a manager, but this would include players. Anybody who's looking at joining United, let's say, would look at it and say, it, yes, there could be a little bit of short-term chaos here, but this is a hell of an opportunity for the biggest club potentially in the world to, that may be on its way back up to do something special. Tell you what, James, if I'm Ken Hogg, I'm nervous. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> Imagine you're in a, in a new job, in a company where you've just been bought out and you're having a whole new management structure being constructed right above you. Mm -hmm. And by definition, their first job is to find problems so that they can have solutions because it's called that performance. And the most obvious and easy one is, hey, this is not our guy. Mm -hmm. And you have to now, you know, they already have people in mind that they believe would be the right person for this job. And I'm pretty certain that does not mean Eric Ten Hag. Um, and I would look at that as a threat and say that yeah. I doubt he's been consulted on any of this as to whether he wants his people in place. Oh, yeah. These are people that uh, you have to get along with. Um, that they have to believe in you and you need to be in a position of strength, which Ten Hag is not. If, I, if I'm him and I'm looking at these people being put in above me, I would be talking to my agent. Yeah, I mean, if simply put, the CEO has been replaced. John Murtaugh has been replaced, even if he moves to another position. Darren Fletcher is being replaced, even if he moves to another position. Every single executive kind of function role at this club on the football side is being replaced. And the manager is the next on that list in that respect. And so I would agree. Look at what quick we remember Zach Moyes, because it wasn't as good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's sometimes as simple as that. That's why it's always been the most likely outcome, kind of regardless of what happens. Sometimes it is that simple. And 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 obviously the results and where things are at are, have not helped that situation. So I guess it... You know, that's an answer we'll find out probably a little closer to summer, whether that happens. I do think it does with these hirings in place, that being the next question to be asked and the results going poorly to where the league is probably over. That clarification, I think, is necessary. Very, very necessary now well, more than ever. Too. I don't think they can wait now to do that. I so, do too. I do too. Yeah. All right, Mama. We'll go ahead and leave it there. Thanks to all of you folks for downloading the podcast as always. Uh, I hope you've had a good two weeks. Sorry for the weekend, even though it was a draw off. Feels like it was a five nil defeat. Um, we will catch you again next week. By then, we will have had Chelsea and Liverpool, and we'll see where we're at. Um, yep. So, good weekend. Bye, man. Take it easy. See you later. See you, folks. See ya.